Stanford University. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to lecture three. I'm Richard. And today we'll talk a little bit more about word vectors. Uh, but before that, uh, let's do three little organizational items. Uh, first, we'll have our first coding session uh, this week. Uh, next, uh, the problem set one has a bunch of programming for you as the first and only one where you will do everything from scratch. So do get started early on it. Um, the coding session is mostly to help you chat with other people, go through small bugs, make sure you have everything set up properly, your environments and everything, so you can get into the exciting uh, deep learning parts right away. Then uh, there's the career fair, the computer science forum. Uh, it's excited to help you find uh, companies to, to work at um, and to talk about your career. And then uh, my first project advice office hours today. I'll just grab a quick dinner after this, and then I'll be back here in the Huang basement uh, to chat mostly about projects. So we encourage you to think about your projects early, and so we'll start that uh, today. Very excited to chat with you if you want to just bounce off ideas in the beginning. Um, that'll be great. All right, any questions around organization? Yes. Um, I think just like outside, yeah, like you can miss it, like right here in front of the class. Any other organizational questions? Oh, yeah, he will hold office hours, too. Uh, and we have a calendar on the website, and you can find all our office hours in the calendar. Oh, OK, we'll fix that. We'll add the names of who is doing the office hours, uh, especially for uh, Chris and mine. Yeah. All right, great. So uh, we'll finish word to vec uh, but then where it gets really interesting is we actually ask uh, what word to vec really captures. Uh, we have you know, these objective functions we're optimizing, and we'll take a bit of a look and analyze what's going on there, and then we'll try to actually capture the essence of word to vec a little more effectively, and then also look at our first analysis of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, evaluations for word vectors. So it'll be... Really exciting, by the end, you actually have a good sense of how to evaluate word vectors, and you have at least two methods under your belt on how to train them. All right, so let's do a quick review of word to vec We ended uh, with this following equation here, uh, where we wanted to basically predict um, the outside vectors uh, from the center word. And so let's just recap really quickly what that meant. So let's say I have at the beginning of a corpus... And it says something like, I like deep learning, comma, or just, and NLP. Now, what we were going to do is we basically want to compute the probability. Let's say we, we start with these word vectors, and this is our first center word, and that's deep. So we want to first compute the probability of the first outside word, I, given the word deep, and that was something like the exponent here of u, o. So the u vector is the outside word, and so that's, in our case, i here, transposed v deep. And then we had this big sum here, and the sum is always the same, given, you know, for a certain vc. So that is the center word. Now, how do we get this v and this u? We basically have a large matrix here with all the different word vectors for all the different words. So it starts with like the vector for aardvark and A and so on, all the way to maybe the vector for zebra, right? And we had basically all our center words V in here. And then we have one large matrix where we have, again, all the vectors starting with aardvark and A and so on, all the way to zebra. And when we start in our first window through this corpus, we basically collect, take the that vector for deep here from this vector of v, plug it in here, and then we want to maximize this probability. Right? And now we'll take the vectors for u for all these different words like I, like, learning, and and. So the next thing would be I, like, 
for like, or the probability of like given deep, and that will be the exponent of u like transpose of vd. And again, we have to divide by this pretty large sum over the entire vocabulary, right? So it's essentially little classification problems all over. So that's the first window of this corpus. Now, when we move to the next window, we'll basically move one over, right? And now the center word is learning, and we want to predict these outside words. So now we'll take, for this next, the second window here, this was the first window, the second window, we'll now take the vector v for learning and the u vector for like, deep, and an NLP. So that was the skip gram model that we talked about in the last lecture, just explained again um, with the same notation. But basically, you take one window at a time, you move that window, and you keep trying to predict the outside words next to the center word. All right, are there any questions around this? Because we'll move, yeah. That's a good question. So how do you actually develop that? You start with all the numbers. All these vectors are just random, little, small, random numbers, uh, often sampled uniformly between two small numbers. And then you take the derivatives with respect to these vectors in order to increase these probabilities. And you essentially take the gradient here of each of these windows with SGD. And so when you take the derivatives that we went through in the last lecture, with respect to all of these uh, different vectors here, you get this very, very large sparse update, right? Because your, all your parameters are essentially all the word vectors. And basically these two matrices with all these different column vectors, right? And so let's say you have 100 dimensional vectors and you have a vocabulary of, let's say, 20,000 words. So that's a lot of different numbers that you have to optimize, right? And so these updates are very, very large, but they're also very sparse, because each window, you usually only see, you know, five words if your window size is two. Yeah? How do you choose the dimension of That's a good question. We'll get to that once we look at the evaluation of these word vectors. This cost function is not convex. It doesn't matter. Sorry. Oh, I should repeat all the questions. Sorry for the people in the video. Um, so the first question was, how do we choose the dimensionality? We'll get to that uh, very, very soon. And then uh, this question here was, uh, how do we start and, uh, you know, how much does it matter? It turns out most of the objective functions, pretty much almost all of them in this lecture, are not convex. And so initialization does matter. And we'll go through tips and tricks on how to circumvent uh, getting stuck in very bad local optima. But it turns out in practice, as long as you initialize with small random numbers, especially in these word vectors, it does not tend to be a problem. All right. So we basically run SGD. This is just a recap of last lecture. We run SGD. We update uh, now our cost function here at each window as we move through the corpus. Right? And so when you think about these updates and you think about implementing that, which you will very soon for problem set one, uh, you'll realize, well, if I have this entire matrix, this entire vector here, sorry, this vector of all these different numbers, and I you know, explicitly actually keep around all these zeros, you have very, very large updates and you'll run out of memory very quickly. And so what instead you want to do is either have very sparse matrix operations where you update only specific columns, you know, in this for the second window, you only have to update the outside vectors for like, deep, and an NLP, and the inside vector for learning. Or you could also implement this as uh, essentially a hash, where you have you know, keys and values, and the values are the vectors, and the keys are the word, uh, the word strings. All right. Now, when I told you this is skip gram, this is a skip gram model, I actually kind of lied a little bit to teach it to you one step at a time, uh, it turns out when you do this computation here, the upper part is pretty simple, right? This is just a 100-dimensional vector, and you multiply that with another 100-dimensional vector. So that's pretty fast. But at each window, and again, you go through an entire corpus, right? You do this 
one step at a time, one word at a time. And for each window, you do this computation, and you do also this gigantic sum. And this sum goes over the entire vocabulary. Again, like potentially 20,000, maybe even a million different words in your whole corpus. Right? So at each window, you have to make 20,000 times uh, this inner product down here. And that's not very efficient. And it turns out, you also don't teach the model that much. At each window, you say, you know, deep learning or learning does not co-occur with zebra. It does not co-occur with artwork. It does not co-occur with like 20,000 other words. And it's kind of repetitive, right? Because most words don't actually appear with most other words. It's pretty sparse. And so the main idea behind Skipgram is a very neat trick, which is we'll just train a couple of binary logistic regressions for the true pairs. So we keep this idea of wanting to optimize uh, and maximize this inner product of the center word and the outside words. But instead of going through all, we'll actually just take a couple of random words and say a couple of these random words from the rest of the corpus don't co-occur. And this leads us to the original objective function of the Skipram model, which sort of as a software package is often called word to vec and uh, you know, the original paper title was Distributed Representations of Words and Phrases and Their Compositionality. And so the overall objective function is as follows. Let's walk through this slowly together. Basically, you go again through each window. So T here corresponds to each window as you go through the corpus. And then we have two terms here. The first one is essentially just a log probability of these two center words and outside words co-occurring. And so the sigmoid here is a simple element-wise function. We'll become very good friends. We'll use the sigmoid function a lot. Um, you'll have to really be able to take derivatives of it and so on. But essentially what it does, it just takes any real number and squishes it to be between 0 and 1. And that's, for deep learning people, good enough to call it a probability. If you're really in statistics, you want to have proper measures and so on, it's not quite that much. But it's a number between 0 and 1. We'll call it a probability. And then we basically can call this here uh, a term that we basically want to maximize the log probability of these two words co-occurring. Any questions about the first term? So this is very similar uh, to before, but then we have the second term here, and the original uh, description was with this expected value here, but really uh, we can have some clearer notation that essentially just shows that we're going to randomly subsample a couple of the words from the corpus, and for each of these, we'll essentially try to minimize their probability of co-occurring. And so one uh, good, good exercise is actually for you in preparation for midterms and whatnot to prove to yourself that 1 of sigmoid of minus x is the same as 1 minus uh, sigmoid of x. That's a nice little quick proof to get into the zone. Um, and so basically, this is 1 minus the probability of this. So we'd subsample a couple of random words from our corpus instead of going through all the different ones saying, you know, artwork doesn't appear, zebra doesn't appear of learning, and so on. We just sample 5 or 10 or so, and then we minimize their probabilities. And so usually we take, and this is, again, a hyperparameter, one that we'll have to evaluate uh, how much it matters. Uh, we'll take k negative samples for the second part here of the objective function for each window, and then we minimize the probability that these random words appear around the center word. And then uh, the way we sample them is actually from a simple uniform or unigram distribution here. Uh, we basically look at how often do the words generally appear, and then we sample them based on that. But we also take the power of 3 fourth. This is kind of a hacky term. You play around with this model for long enough. You say, oh, well, maybe it should more often sample some of these rare words, because otherwise it would very, very often sample the and a and other stop words, and we would probably never, ever sample Aardvark and Zebra um, in our corpus, so you take this to the power of 3 fourth. And you don't have to implement this function. We'll just give it to you because you kind of have to compute uh, the statistics of how often each word appears uh, in the corpus, but we'll give this to you in the problem set. All right, so any questions around the skip gram model? That's right. That is just a, so the question is, does it, um, is it a choice of how to define P of W? And it is a choice. It's, you could do a lot of different things there, but it turns out a very simple thing, 
like just taking the unigram distribution, uh, you know, how often does this word appear, um, works well enough. So people haven't really explored more complex versions than that. That's a good question. Do we, should we make sure that uh, the random samples here don't, aren't the same uh, as exactly this word? Yes, but it turns out that the probability for very large corpora is so tiny that the very, very few times that ever happens is kind of relevant because you randomly subsample so much that it doesn't change. Orders of magnitude for which part? Oh, okay, uh, it's like 10. It's relatively small. And it's an interesting trade-off that you'll observe in uh, actually several deep learning models. Uh, often, uh, as you go through the corpus, you could do an update after each window, but you could also say, let's go through five windows, collect the updates, uh, and then make a really a step uh, in your, so you have mini batch stochastic gradient descent. We'll go through a lot of these kinds of options um, later in the class. All right. Last question on Skipgram. What does JT of theta represent? Oh, it's a good question. So theta is often something, uh, a parameter that we use for all the variables in our model. So in our case here for the Skipgram model, it's essentially all the U vectors and all the V vectors. Uh, later on, when we'll call, we'll call it theta, it might have other parameters of the neural network, layers, and so on. Uh, and J is just our cost function, and T is at the teeth time step or the teeth window as we go through our corpus. So in the end, the overall objective function that we actually optimize is the sum of all of them, but again, we don't want to do one large update of the entire corpus, right? We don't want to go through all the windows, collect all the updates, and then make one gigantic step, because that usually doesn't work very well. So... Good, good question. I think last lecture we talked a lot about minimization. Here we have these log probabilities, and in the paper we want to maximize that. And it's often very intuitive, right? Once you have probabilities, you usually want to maximize the probability of the actual thing that you see in your corpus happening. And in other times when we call it a cost function, we want to minimize the cost um, and so on. All right. So... Uh, in WordVec, there's another model, which you won't have to implement unless you want to get bonus points, uh, but we're, we will ask you to take derivatives off, and so it's good to uh, understand it at least on a very simple conceptual level. And it's, it's very similar uh, to the Skipgram model. Basically, we want to predict the center word from the sum of the surrounding words. So very simply here, we sum up the vector of and, of NLP, and of deep, and of like. We have now the sum of these vectors, and then we have some inner products with just a vector of the inside. And basically, that's called the continuous bag of words model. You'll learn all about the details and the definition of that in the problem set. So what actually happens when we train these word vectors, right? We optimize this objective function, uh, and we take gradients. And after a while, something kind of magical happens to these word vectors. And that is that they actually start to cluster around similar kinds of meaning, and sometimes also similar kinds of uh, syntactic functions. So when we zoom in, and again, this is, you know, usually these vectors are 25 to, you know, even 500 or 1,000 dimensional. This is just a PCA uh, visualization of these vectors. And what we'll observe is that, you know, Tuesday and Thursday and weekdays cluster together, number terms cluster together, uh, first words, uh, first names cluster together, and so on. So basically, words that appear in similar contexts turn out to often have the similar meaning, as we discussed in the previous lecture, and so they essentially get similar vectors after we train these, this model for a sufficient number of steps. All right, so let's summarize word to vec. Basically, we went through each word in the corpus, we looked at the surrounding words in the window. We predict the surrounding words. Now, what we're essentially doing there is trying to capture the co-occurrence of words. How often does this word co-occur with the other word? And we do that one count at a time. And it's like, oh, I see that deep and learning happen. I make an update to both of these vectors. 
and then you go over the corpus, and then you probably will eventually see deep and learning co-occurring again, and you make again a separate update step. And when you think about that, it's not very efficient, right? Why don't we just go through the entire corpus once, count how often does deep and learning co-occur, how often do these two words co-occur, and then we make one update step that captures the entire count instead of one you know, sample at a time. And yes, we can do that. And that is actually a method that came historically before word to vec uh, And there are different options of how we can do this. The simplest one, uh, or the one that is similar to word to vec at least, is that we again use a window around each word. And we basically just go through the entire corpus. We don't update anything. We don't do any SGD. We just collect the counts first. And once we have the counts, then we do something to that matrix. And so when we look at just a window of like, you know, length maybe two, like in this example here, or maybe five, some small window size around each word, what we'll do is we'll capture not just the semantics, but also some of the syntactic information of each word, namely what kind of part of speech tag is it. So verbs are going to be closer to one another than uh, the verbs are to the nouns, for instance. Uh, if, on the other hand, we look at co-occurrence counts that aren't just around the window, but the entire document. So I don't just look at you know, each window, but I say, this word appears with all these other words in this entire Wikipedia article, for instance, or this entire Word document. Then what you'll capture is actually more uh, topics. And this is often called latent semantic analysis. It's a big, uh, popular model uh, from uh, a while back. And basically, what you'll get there is you ignore the part of speech tag. You ignore any kind of syntactic information. You just say, well, swimming and boat and water and weather and the sun, they are all kind of appear in the topic, in this topic together, in this document together. So we won't go into too many details for these because they turn out for a lot of other downstream tasks like machine translation or so on. We really want to use these windows, but it's good, to, it's good knowledge to have. So let's go over a simple example of what it would, what we would do if we had a very small corpus and want to collect these windows and then compute word vectors from that. So it's technically not cosine because we're not normalizing over the length. And technically, we're not optimizing sort of inner product, but these probabilities and, and so on. But continue. That's right. So the question is, uh, in all these visualizations here, uh, we kind of look at Euclidean distance. And it's true, we're actually often are going to use inner product uh, kinds of similarities. Uh, so yes. In some cases, Euclidean distance works reasonably well still, despite not doing this. In fact, we'll see one evaluation that is entirely based, or partly based, on, on Euclidean distances and partly on inner products. So it turns out both work well, despite our objective function only having this. And even more surprising, there are a lot of other things that work quite well in this, despite starting with this kind of objective function. We often, yeah, so even despite having uh, only these inner product optimizations, we will actually also do often very well in terms of Euclidean distances. Yep. Well, it gets complicated. But there are some interesting relationships between the ratios of the co-occurrence counts. If we, we don't have enough time to dive into the details, but if you are interested in that, um, I will talk about a paper and mention the title of the paper in like five or ten slides that will help you understand it a little better and gain some more interest. All right, so window-based co-occurrence matrices. So let's say we have this corpus here, and let's define our window length as just one for simplicity. Usually we have, you know, more commonly five to ten windows around there. Uh, and we assume we have a symmetric window. So we don't care if a word is to the left or to the right of our center word, and we have this corpus. So this is essentially what a, what a window-based co-occurrence matrix would be for this very, very simple corpus. We just look at the word I, and then we look at which words appear next to I. And so we look at I, we see like twice, so we have a number two here, and we see enjoy once, so we 
put account one here. And then we know we have the word like, and so like co-occurs twice with the word I on its left, and once with deep, and once with NLP. And so this is essentially, we go through all the words in a very large corpus, and we compute all these counts. Super simple. Now, you could say, well, that's a vector already, right? You have you know, a list of numbers here, and that list of numbers now represents that word. And you already kind of capture you know, things like, well, like and enjoy have some overlap, so maybe they're more similar. So you already have a word vector, right? But now, it's not a very ideal word vector uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one is, if you have a new word in your vocabulary, that word vector changes. So if you have some downstream machine learning models now that take that vector as input, they always have to change, and there's always some parameter missing. Also, this vector is going to be very high dimensional. Of course, for this tiny corpus, it's small, but generally it will have tens of thousands of words, so it's a very high dimensional vector. So you'll have uh, sparsity issues if you try to train a machine learning model on this afterwards, and that results in much less robust uh, downstream models. And so the solution to that is let's, again, have the similar idea to word to vec, uh, and have just don't store all the core currents, counts every single number, but just to store most of the important information, a fixed small number of dimensions, similar to word to vec. Those will be somewhere around 25 to 1,000 dimensions. And then the question is, okay, how do we now reduce the dimensionality? We have these very large core occurrence matrices here. In the realistic setting, we'll have you know, 20,000 by 20,000, even a million by a million, very large sparse matrix. How do we reduce the dimensionality? And the answer is, we'll just use very simple SVD. Uh, so who here is familiar with singular value decomposition? All right, good. Majority of people. Uh, if you're not, then I strongly suggest you go to the office hours and uh, brush up on your linear algebra. Um, but basically, uh, we'll have here this uh, x hat matrix, which is going to be our best rank k approximation to our original core occurrence matrix x. And uh, we'll have basically these three simple uh, matrices uh, with orthonormal uh, columns, uh, or U, we often call also our uh, left singular vectors. And we have here S, the diagonal matrix containing all the singular values, usually, usually uh, from largest to smallest. And we have um, our uh, matrix V here, our orthonormal rows. And so in code, this is also extremely simple. We can literally implement this in just a few lines. Uh, if we have, this is our corpus here, and this is our uh, core occurrence matrix X, then we can simply run SVD with one line of Python code, and then we get this matrix U. And now we can take the first two uh, columns here of U and plot them. Right? And if we do this uh, in the first two dimensions here, uh, we'll actually get a similar kind of visualization to all these other ones I've shown you. Right? But it's just a few lines of Python code to create that kind of word vector. And we'll, can now, it's kind of reading tea leaves. Uh, none of these dimensions, we can't really say, oh, this dimension is, you know, the verbness of a noun, of, of a word or something like that. Uh, but as you look at these long enough, you'll definitely observe some kinds of patterns. So, for instance, uh, I and like are very frequent words in this corpus, and they're a little further to the left, so that's one like and enjoy uh, our nearest neighbors in this space. So that's another observation. They're both verbs, uh, and so on. So the things that were being liked, uh, you know, flying and deep and other things are closer together, and so on. So with such a very simple method, you get a first approximation to what word vectors can and, and should capture. Are there any questions around this SVD method and the core occurrence matrix? Um, it's a good question. Is the window always symmetric? And the answer is uh, no. We can actually evaluate uh, asymmetric windows and symmetric windows, and I'll show you the result of that in a couple of slides. All right. Now, once you realize, oh, wow, this is so simple, and it works kind of well, and you're a researcher, you always want to try to improve it a little bit, and so there are a lot of different hacks that we can make uh, to this core currents matrix. So instead of taking the raw counts, for instance, as you do this, you realize, well, a lot of representational power in these word vectors is now captured uh, by the fact that the 
and he and has and a lot of other very, very frequent words co-occur with almost all the nouns. Like the appears in the window of pretty much every noun out there. And it doesn't really add, give us that much information that it does over and over and over again. And so one thing we can do is actually just cap it and say, all right, whatever the co-occurs with the most and a lot of other uh, one of these function words, I will just maximize the count at 100. Or, and some people do this also, we just ignore a couple of the most frequent words because they really, it's, we have a power law distribution or a SIPS law uh, where basically the most frequent words appear much, much more frequently than other words and then it peters out and then there's a very long tail of words that don't appear that often. But those very rare words actually ha often have a lot of semantic uh, content. Then another way... Uh, we can change this, uh, the way we compute these counts is by not counting all the words equally. So we can say, well, words that appear right next to my center word get a count of one, but words that appear you know, five steps away, five words away, only get a count of 0.5. And so that's another hack we can do. And then instead of counts, we could compute correlations and set them to zero. You get the idea. You can play around uh, with this matrix of co-occurrence counts in a variety of different ways. And sometimes uh, they help quite significantly. So in 2005, so quite a long time ago, people used this SVD method and compared a lot of different um, different ways of hacking uh, the co-occurrence matrix and modifying it, uh, and basically found quite surprising and awesome results. And so this is another way we can try to visualize this very high-dimensional space. Again, these vectors are usually around 100 dimensions or so, so it's hard to visualize it. And so instead of projecting it down to just 2D, here they just choose a couple of words and they look at the nearest neighbors and how which word is closest uh, to what other word. And they find that you know wrist and ankle are closest to one another, and the next closest word is shoulder, and the next closest one is arm, and so on. So different extremities cluster together. Uh, we'll see different cities clustering together, and you know, American cities are closer to one another than uh, cities from uh, other countries, and country names are close together, and so on. So it's quite amazing, right? Even with something as simple as SVD around these windows, you capture a lot of uh, different kinds of information. In fact, uh, it even goes to syntactic and grammatical kinds of patterns that are captured uh, by this SVD method. So show, showed shown or take, took, taken, and so on, are all always uh, together in often similar kinds of patterns. And it goes further and even more semantic than the verbs that uh, are very similar uh, and related to these kinds of nouns often appear even in roughly similar kinds of Euclidean distances. So, you know... Um, Swim and swimmer, clean and janitor, drive and driver, teach and teacher, they all basically have a similar kind of uh, vector uh, difference. And intuitively, you would think, well, they appear, they ha often have similar kinds of contexts in which they appear, and uh, there's, there's some intuitive uh, sense of why, why this would happen as you're trying to capture these core occurrence counts. Does the language matter? Um, yes. In what, what way? Oh, great question. So is it, if it was German instead of English. So uh, it's actually a sad kind of truth of a lot of natural language processing research that the majority of it is in English. Uh, and few people do this. It turns out this works for a lot of other languages, but people don't have as good evaluation metrics often for these other languages and evaluation data sets which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but we would believe it works for pretty much all languages. Now, there's a lot of complexity because some languages like Finnish or German have potentially a lot of different words because they're uh, much richer morphology, right? German has compound nouns. Uh, and so you get more and more rare words. And then the rarer the words are, the less good counts you have of them and the harder it is to use this method uh, in a vanilla way which eventually in the limit will get us to character-based natural language processing, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. But in general, this works for pretty much any language. Great question. 
So now, what's the problem here? Uh, well, SVD, while being very simple and one nice line of Python code, is actually computationally not always great, especially as we get larger and larger matrices. So we essentially have this quadratic uh, cost here in uh, the smaller dimension. So either if it's a word-by-word -word co-occurrence matrix or even a word-by-document, we would assume this gets very, very large. And then it also gets hard to incorporate new words or documents into, um, into this whole model because you have to rerun this whole PCA, uh, or sorry, the SVD, uh, single value decomposition. Uh, and then on top of that, SVD and the op how we optimize that is quite different to a lot of the other downstream deep learning methods that we'll use, like neural networks and so on. It's a very different kind of optimization. And so the word to vec objective function is similar to SGD. You look at one window at a time, you make an update step, and that's very similar to how we optimize most of the other models um, in this lecture and in deep learning for NLP. And so basically what we came up with, um, with uh, postdoc and, and Chris's group, uh, so Jeffrey Pennington, me, and, and Chris, is a method that tries to combine the best of both worlds. So let's summarize what the, the advantages and disadvantages are of these two different kinds of methods. Uh, basically, we have these count-based methods based on SVD and the core occurrence matrix, and we have the window-based or direct prediction methods like the skip cram model. The advantages of uh, PCA is that uh, it's relatively fast to train unless uh, the matrix gets very, very large, but we're making very efficient usage uh, of the statistics that we have, right? We only have to collect the statistics once, and we could, in theory, throw away the whole corpus, and then we can try a lot of different things on just these core occurrence counts. Sadly, uh, when you do this, it captures mostly word similarity and not various other patterns that the word to vec model captures, and we'll show you that what that those are in evaluation. And we give often disproportionate importance to these large counts. And we can try various ways of lowering the importance that these function words and very frequent words have. The advantage um, of, or the disadvantage uh, of the skip crime model is that it scales with the corpus size, right? You have to go through every single window, which is not very efficient. Uh, and henceforth, you also don't really make very efficient usage of the statistics that you have overall of the data set. However, we actually get, in many cases, much better performance on downstream tasks. And we don't know yet those downstream tasks. That's why we have the whole lecture for this whole quarter. But for a variety of different uh, problems like named entity recognition or part of speech tagging and so on, things that you'll implement in the problem sets, uh, it turns out the Skipgram-like models turn out to work slightly better. And we can capture various complex patterns, uh, some of which are very surprising and we'll get to in the second part of this lecture. And so basically what we tried to do here is combining the best of both of these worlds and the result of that was the GLOVE model, or global vectors model. So let's walk through this objective function a little bit. Again, theta here will be all our parameters. Uh, so in this case, again, we have these u and these v vectors but they're even more symmetric now. We basically just go through all pairs of words that might ever co-occur. So we go through these very large co-occurrence matrix that we compute in the beginning, uh, we call P here. And for each pair of words in this entire corpus, uh, we basically want to minimize uh, the distance between the inner product here and the log count of these two words. So again, this is just this kind of matrix here that we're going over. We're going over all elements of this kind of core occurrence matrix. But instead of running uh, the large SVD, we'll basically just take one, uh, optimize one such count at a time here. So I have the square of this distance. And then we also have this term here, F, which allows us to weight even lower uh, some of these very frequent kinds of uh, core occurrences. So the, for instance, uh, will have a maximum uh, amount that we can weigh it inside this overall objective function. All right, so now what this allows us to do is essentially we can train very quickly because instead of saying, all right, we'll optimize that deep and learning co-occur in one window and then we'll go in a couple of windows later, they co-occur again and we update again, we just once say, all right, deep and learning co-occur in this entire corpus which could now be you know, all of Wikipedia or, in our case, all of Common Crawl, which is 
most of the internet. That's kind of amazing. It's a gigantic corpus with billions of tokens. And we just say, all right, deep in learning in this billions of you know, documents occur 536 times or something like that, probably now a lot more often. And then we just optimize basically this inner product to be close uh, in its value to the log of, those, of that overall count. And because of that, it scales uh, to very large corpora, which is great because the rare words appear not very often, and this will allow us to capture even rare, like the semantics of very rare words. And it, because of the efficient usage of the statistics, it turns out to also work very well on small corpora and even with smaller vector sizes. So now you might be confused because in the visualization, we keep showing you a single vector, but here we again, just like with the skip cram vector, we have V vectors, the outside vectors, and the inside vectors. And so let's uh, get rid of that confusion and basically tell you that there are a lot of different options of how you get eventually just a single vector from having these two vectors. You could concatenate them, but it turns out what works best is just to sum them up. They essentially both capture co-occurrence counts, and if we just sum them, uh, that turns out to work best in practice. And uh, that also destroys some of the intuitions of why certain things uh, should happen, but it turns out in practice this works best. Yeah. What are u and v again? So u here are again just the, the vectors of all the words. And so here, um, just like with the skip gram, we had you know, the inside and the outside vectors. Here, u and v are just uh, the vectors in the column and the vectors in the row. They're essentially interchangeable, uh, and because of that, it makes even more sense to sum them up. Uh, you could even say, well, why don't you just have one set of vectors, right? But then you'd have a more, a less well-behaved objective function here because you have the inner product between uh, two of the same sets of parameters, and it turns out in terms of the optimization, having the separate vectors during the optimization and combining them at the very end just is much more stable. That's right. It's, yeah, even for skipgram, that's the question. Is it common also for skipgram to sum them up? It is. And uh, it's, a good, it's good whenever you have these choices and they seem a little arbitrary, also for all your projects. The best thing to always do is like, well, there are two things. You could just come to me and say, hey, what should I do, X or Y? And the true answer, especially as you get closer to your project and to more research and novel kinds of applications, the best answer is always try all of them. And then have a real metric, uh, a quantitative measure of how well all of them do, and then have a nice little table in, in your final project uh, description that tells you very concretely what it is. And once you do that many times, you'll gain some intuitions, and you realize, all right, for the fifth project, you just realized, well, summing them up usually works best, so I'm just going to continue doing that. Uh, but in, in the, especially as you get into the field, it's good to try a lot of these different knobs and hyperparameters. That's right. They're all on the same scale here. Really, they're quite interchangeable, especially for the glove model. Is that a question? All right. I'll try to repeat it. So in theory here, uh, you're right. So the question is... Uh, does the magnitude of these vectors matter? Is that a good paraphrase? Um, and so you're right, uh, it does, but in the end, uh, you will see them basically in very similar contexts a lot of times. And so in this log here, you, they will eventually have to capture this, the log count, right? So they will have to go to a certain size of what these log counts usually are. And then the model just figures out that they are, in the end, roughly in the same, same place. There's no, nothing in the optimization that pushes some vectors to get really, really large, except, of course, the vectors the, of words that appear very frequently. And that's why we have exactly this term here, to basically cap the importance of the very frequent words. <laughs> 
Yes. So the question is, uh, and I'll just phrase it in the way it is, which is right. Uh, the skip gram model tries to capture co-occurrences one window at a time. Uh, and the glove model tries to capture the counts of the overall statistics of how often these words appear together. All right. One more question. I think there were one. Was one? No. Nope. All right. Great. So now we can look at some fun results. Uh, and basically, we we found like oh the nearest neighbors for frog were like all these various words, and we're first a little worried, but then we looked them up and realized all right those are actually quite good. So you'll see here even for very rare words, um, glove will give you very very good nearest neighbors in the space. And so next we'll do the evaluation, but before that uh, we'll do a little intermission with Arun. Take it away. Uh, cool. So uh, we've been talking about word vectors. I'm going to take a brief detour to talk about polysemy. Uh, so far we've seen that word vectors encode similarity. We see that similar concepts are even distributed in Euclidean space near each other. And the question I want you to think about is, what do we do about polysemy? Suppose you have a word like tie. Uh, tie could mean something like a tie in a game. So maybe it should be near this cluster. Uh, uh, over here. It could be a piece of clothing, so maybe it should be near this cluster, or it could be an action like braid twist, should be near this cluster. Where should it lie? So this paper uh, by Sanjeev Arora uh, and, and the entire group, uh, they seek to answer this question. And one of the first things they find is that uh, if you had an imaginary, you could split up tie into these polysemous vectors, you had tie one every time you talked about the sports event, tie two every time you talked about the uh, garment of clothing, uh, then you can show that this, the, the actual tie that is a combination of all of these words lies uh, in the su linear superposition of all of these vectors. You might be wondering, how is this vector close to all of them? But that's because we're projecting this into a 2D plane, and so it actually is closer to them in other dimensions. Uh, now that we, we know that this tie lies near or in, this, in the plane of the th different senses, we might be curious to find out, can we actually find out what the different senses of a word are? Suppose we, we only can see this word tie. Could we, could, could we computationally find out through some co occurrence statistics that tie had a meaning about sports, clothing, etc.? So the second thing that they're able to show is that there's an algorithm called sparse coding that is able to recover these. I don't have time to discuss exactly what sparse coding, how the algorithm works, but let me describe the model. The model says that every word vector you have is composed as the uh, sum of a small selected number of what are called context vectors. So these context vectors, there are only 2,000 that they found for their entire corpus, are common across every word. But every word, like tie, is only composed of a small number of these context vectors. So the context vector could be something like sports, etc. There's some noise added in, but that's not very important. Uh, and so if you look at the type of output that you get for something like tie, you see something to do with sports, with, uh, sorry, with clothing, with sports. Uh, very interestingly, you also see output about music. Some of you might realize that actually makes sense. Uh, and now we might wonder how this is qualitative. Is there a way we can quantitatively evaluate how good the senses we recover are? So uh, it turns out, yes, you can. And here's the sort of experimental setup. So uh, for every word that was taken from WordNet, uh, a number of about 20 sets of related senses were picked up. So a bunch of words that represent that sense, like tie, blouser, pants, or something totally unrelated like computer, mouse, and keyboard. And so now they asked a bunch of grad students, because they're guinea pigs, uh, to differentiate if they could find out which one of these words correspond to tie. And they also asked the algorithm if it could make that distinction. The interesting thing is that uh, the performance of this method that I alluded to earlier is about at the same level as the non-native grad students that they had surveyed, which I think is, is interesting. Uh, the native speakers do better on the task. 
so in summary, word vectors can indeed capture polysemy. It turns out these polysemies, the word vectors are in the linear superposition of the polysemous vectors. Uh, you can recover the senses that a polysemous word has with sparse coding, and the senses that you recover are almost as good as uh, that of a non-native English speaker. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Arun. All right. So now on to evaluating word vectors. So we've had, you know, gone through now a bunch of new machinery. And you say, well, how well does it actually work? Uh, you know, I have all these different hyperparameters. What's the window size? What's the vector size? And we already came up with these questions. You know, how much does it matter? How do we choose them? And this, these are all the answers uh, now. Well, at least some of them. Uh, so on a very high level, and this will be true for a lot of your projects as well, you can make a high-level decision of whether you will have an intrinsic or an extrinsic evaluation of whatever project you're doing. And in the case of word vectors, uh, that is no different. So intrinsic evaluations are usually on some specific or intermediate subtask. So we might, for instance, look at how well do these vector differences or vector similarities in a product correlate with human judgments of similarity. And we'll go through a couple of these kinds of evaluations uh, in the next couple of slides. The advantage of intrinsic evaluations is that they're going to be very fast to compute. You have your vectors, you run them through this quick uh, you know, similarity correlation study, and you get a number out, and you claim, can claim victory very quickly, and then, or you can modify your model and try 50,000 different little knobs uh, and combinations and tune, uh, tune this very quickly. It sometimes helps you really understand very quickly how your system works, what kinds of hyperparameters actually have an impact on this metric of similarity, for instance. However, um, there's no, no free lunch here. Uh, it's not clear sometimes if your intermediate or intrinsic evaluation and improvements actually carry out to be a real improvement in some task real people will care about. And real people is a little tricky definition. Um, I guess real people usually will assume are like normal people who want to just have a machine translation system or a question answering system or something like that. Uh, and not necessarily linguists uh, and natural language processing researchers in the field. And so sometimes uh, you actually observe people uh, like trying to optimize their intrinsic evaluations a lot and they spend years of their life optimizing them. And other people later find out, well, it turns out those improvements on your intrinsic task when I actually apply your better word vectors or something to name entity recognition or part of speech tagging or machine translation, I don't see an improvement. So then the question is, well, how useful is your intrinsic evaluation task? So as you go down this route, and a lot of you will for their projects, you always want to make sure you establish some kind of correlation between these. Now, the extrinsic one is basically evaluation on a real task. And that's really, you know, where the rubber hits the road or the proof's in the pudding or whatever. Um, the problem with that is that it can take a very long time. You have your new word vectors and you're like, oh, I, you know, took the Pearson correlation instead of the raw count of my core occurrence matrix. I think this is the best thing ever. Now I want to evaluate whether that new word vector really helps for machine translation. And you say, all right, now I'm going to take my word vectors and plug them into this machine translation system. And that turns out to take a week to train. And then you have to wait a long time, and now you have 10 other knobs, and before you know it, the year's over. And you can't really just do that every time you have a tiny little improvement uh, on, on your first uh, early word vectors, for instance. So that's the problem. It takes a long time. And then often people will also make the mistake of tuning a lot of different subsystems, and then they put it all together into the full system, the real task, like machine translation, and something overall has improved, but now it's unclear which part actually gave the improvement. And maybe two parts were actually, you know, one was really good, the other one was bad, they cancel each other out, and so on. So you want to basically, when you use extrinsic evaluations, be very certain that you only change one thing that you came up with, or one aspect of your word vectors, for instance, and if you then get an improvement on your overall downstream task, then you're really in a good place. So let's be more explicit and go through some of these intrinsic word vector evaluations. Uh, one that was very popular uh, and came out uh, just very recently with the word to vec paper was these word vector analogies, where basically they found, which is initially very surprising to a lot of people, that uh, you have amazing 
kinds of semantic and syntactic analogies that are captured, captured through these cosine distances in these vectors. So, for instance, you might ask, you know, what is, when, what is man to woman uh, in the relationship of king to another word? And, you know, basically a simple analogy. Man to woman is like king to queen. That's right. And so it turns out that when you just take the vector of woman, you subtract the vector of man, and you add the vector of king, and then you try to find the vector that has the largest cosine similarity, it turns out the vector of queen is actually that vector that has the largest cosine similarity to this term. And so that is quite amazing, and it works for a lot of different kinds of very intuitive patterns. So let's go through a couple of them. So you'd have similar things like, you know, sir to madam is similar as man to woman, or heir to heiress, or king to queen, or emperor to empress, and so on. So they all have a similar kind of uh, relationship that is captured very well by these cosine distances and these simple uh, Euclidean uh, subtractions and additions here. It goes even more specific. You have uh, similar kinds of companies and their CEO names. Right? You can take company uh, title minus CEO plus other company and you get to the vector of the name of the CEO of that other company. Uh, and it works not just for semantic relationships but also for syntactic relationships. So, you know, slow, slower, slowest in, in these glove things has a very similar kind of uh, difference uh, and, and so on to short, shorter, and shortest, or strong, stronger, and strongest. So the, and you can have a lot of fun with this, and people did. So here, here are some even more fun fun ones, like uh, sushi minus Japan plus Germany goes to Bratwurst, and, and so on. So, um, which, as a German, I'm mildly offended by, but... Um, and so... And of course, you know, it's, it's very, it's very intuitive in some ways, but it's also questionable, right? Maybe it should have been Spätzle or whatever, right? Other typical terrible German foods. Um, and so, uh, while this is very intuitive, uh, and, and, you know, for some people, um, in terms of the actual semantics that are captured here, you might really wonder why this has happened. And there is no, like, mathematical proof of why this has to fall out, but intuitively, you can kind of make sense of it a little bit, right? So superlatives, for instance, uh, might appear next to uh, certain words uh, very often uh, in similar kinds of ways. So maybe most, for instance, appears in front of a lot of superlatives. Um, or barely, uh, you know, might appear in front of certain words uh, that, you know, like slower or shorter. It's barely... Uh, shorter than this other person. And since in these vectors you're capturing these co-occurrence counts, as you take out, you know, uh, basically one co-occurrence, you subtract that one co-occurrence, intuitively it's, it's, you know, it's a little hand wavy. There's no, like, again, here, this is not a nice mathematical proof, but intuitively you can see how similar kinds of words appeared and you subtract those counts and hence you arrive in similar kinds of uh, places in the vector space. Now, First, you, you try a couple of these, and you're surprised that this works well, and then you want to make it a little more quantitative, all right? So this was a qualitative, you know, subsample of some words where this works incredibly well. It's also true that when you really play around with it for a while, you'll find some things where, like, oh, like, Audi minus German goes to some crazy sushi term or something. Like, it, it doesn't always make sense, but there are a lot of them where it, it really is uh, surprisingly intuitive. And so people essentially then came up with uh, a data set to try to see how often does it really appear um, and does it really uh, work this well. And so they basically uh, collected this word vector analogies task. Uh, and these are some examples. You can download all of them uh, on this link here. This is, the, again, the original word to vec paper that discovered uh, and described these linear relationships. And they basically look at, you know, Chicago and Illinois and Houston, Texas. And you can basically come up with a lot of different analogies where, you know, this city appears in that state. Of course, there are some problems. And, you know, as you optimize this metric more and more, you'll observe like, oh, well, maybe that city name actually appears, you know, multiple different cities and different states have the same name and then it kind of depends on the corpus that you're training on, on whether this is being captured or not. 
But still, a lot of people, uh, it makes a lot of sense for most of them uh, to optimize this, at least for a little bit. Uh, here are some other examples of analogies that are in this data set that are being captured. And just like the capital and the world, of course, you know, as those change, if it doesn't change in your corpus, um, that, that's also problematic. But in many cases, the capitals of countries don't change. And so it's quite intuitive. And here are some examples of syntactic relationships and analogies uh, that are basically in this data set to evaluate. So we have several thousands of these analogies. And now we compute our word vectors. We tune some knob. We change a hyperparameter. You know, instead of 25 dimensions, we have 50 dimensions. And we want to evaluate which one is better for these analogies. And again, here's another syntactic one with past tense kinds of relationship. So dancing to dance should be like going to when. Now, we can basically look at a lot of different methods. And we don't know all of these uh, in the class here, but we know the skipgram SG and the glove model. And here is the first evaluation on, uh, that is quanti quantitative um, and basically looks at the semantic and the syntactic relationships and then just average in terms of the total and just says how often is exactly this relationship true for all these different analogies that we have here in the data set. And it turns out that uh, when this, both of these papers uh, came out in 2013 and 14, um, basically GLOVE was the best uh, at capturing these relationships. And so we observe a couple of interesting things here. One, uh, it turns out, Sometimes more dimensions don't actually help in capturing these relationships better. Um, so 1,000-dimensional vectors work worse than 300-dimensional vectors. Another interesting observation, and that is something that is uh, somewhat sadly true for pretty much every deep learning model ever, is more data will work better. So if you train your word vectors on 42 billion tokens, it will work better than on 6 billion tokens uh, by, you know, 4% or so. So here we have the same 300 dimensions. Again, we only want to change one thing to understand whether that one change actually has an, a, an impact. And we'll see here uh, a big gap. It's a good question. How come the performance sometimes goes down? It turns out it also depends on where what you're training your word vectors on. So it turns out Wikipedia, for instance, is really great because Wikipedia has very good descriptions of all these capitals and all the world. But now if you take news, and let's say take US news, and in US news, you might not have uh, Abuja and Ashgabat mentioned very often. Well, then the vectors for those words will also not capture their semantics very well. And so you will do worse. And so some not bigger is not always better. It also depends on the quality of the data that you have. And Wikipedia you know, has less misspellings than general internet text and so on. And it's, it's actually a very good data set. And so here are some of the evaluations. Uh, and uh, you know, we had a lot of questions of like, oh, how do we choose this hyperparameter, the size, and so on. And this is, I think, a very good and careful analysis that, that Jeffrey had done here uh, three years ago on a variety of these different hyperparameters that we've observed and kind of mentioned in passing. And so this is also a great uh, sort of way that you should try to emulate for your projects. Whenever I see plots like this, I get a big smile on my face, and your grades just like improve right away. <laughs> Unless you make certain mistakes in your plots, but uh, let's let's go let's go through them. So here uh, we look at basically the symmetric context. Uh, the asymmetric context is where we only count words that happen after uh, the current word, so we ignore the things in before. But it turns out symmetric usually works better. And so vector dimension here is, uh, is a good one to evaluate. right? It's pretty fundamental how high dimensional should these be. And we basically observe that when they're very small, um, it doesn't work as well in capturing these analogies. But then after around 200, 300, it actually kind of peters out. Uh, and then it doesn't get much better. In fact, uh, overall, uh, it's pretty flat between 300 and 600. And this is, this is good. So the main number we often look at here is the overall accuracy, and that's uh, in red here, and that's flat. So one mistake you could make when you create such a plot is you improve, you have some hyperparameter, and you have some kind of accuracy, 
This could be the word vector size. And you create a nice plot and you say, oh, look, things got better. And then my comment, if I see a plot like this, would be, well, why didn't you go further in this direction? It seems to just be going up and up. Like, so that is not good. You should find your plots until they actually kind of peter out. And you say, all right, now I really found the optimum value for this hyperparameter. Um, so another uh, important thing to evaluate here is the window size. Uh, and you know, there are sometimes considerations around this. So word vectors, for instance, maybe the you know, 200 worked here slightly better than, or 300 worked slightly better than 200. But larger word vectors also means more RAM, right? Your software now needs to store more data. Uh, and you need to, you know, when you might want to ship it to a cell phone. And now, yes, you might get 2% improvement on this intrinsic task, but you also, you know, have 30% higher RAM requirements. And maybe you say, well, I don't care about those 2% or so improvement in accuracy on this intrinsic task. I still choose a smaller word vector. So that's a legit argument. But in general here, we're just trying to optimize uh, this, this metric and so we want to look at carefully what these are. All right, now window size. Again, this is you know, how many words to the left and to the right of each of the center words do we want to predict um, and, and co compute the counts for. Turns out around uh, eight or so you get the highest. But again, that also increases uh, the uh, complexity and the training time. The longer the windows are, the more times you have to compute these kinds of expressions. And then for asymmetric context, uh, it's actually slightly different uh, window size that, that works best. All right, any question around these uh, evaluations? Great. Um, now, it's very hard actually to compare GloVe and the script grind model because they're very different kinds of training regimes. Right? One goes through the one window at a time, the other one first computes all the counts and then uh, works on the counts, and so this is kind of uh, us trying to do well and, and answer a reviewer question of you know when you compare them directly. So what we did here is we looked at the negative samples. Remember we had that sum and the objective function for the Skipgram model of how many words we want to push down the probability of because they don't appear in that window. And so that is one way to increase training time and in theory do better on that objective. Uh, versus different iterations of how often do we go over this core occurrence count to optimize uh, each pair uh, in the core occurrence matrix for GloVe. And in this, this evaluation, GloVe did better regardless of how many hours uh, you sort of trained both models. And uh, this is, you know, more data helps uh, that the argument already made, uh, especially um, Wikipedia. So here, GigaWord is, I think, mostly a news corpus. So news, uh, despite being more, actually uh, does not work quite as well overall, and especially not uh, for semantic um, relationships and analogies. But Common Crawl, which is a super large data set of 42 billion tokens, works best. All right, so now these amazing analogies of king minus man plus woman and so on um, were very exciting. Uh, before that, people used often just uh, correlation judgments. So basically, they asked a bunch of people, often grad students, uh, and you know, to give on a scale of 1 to 10, how similar do you think these two words are? So tiger and cat, when you ask you know, three or five humans, on a scale from 1 to 10, how similar they are, they might say, you know, one might say seven, the other eight, other six or something like that, and then you average. And then you get basically a score here of similarities. You know, computer and internet are seven, but stock and CD are not very similar at all. And so a bunch of people will say, oh, on a scale from one to 10, it's only 1.3 on average. Uh, and now we could try to basically say, all right, we want to train word vectors such that the vectors ha have a high correlation in their distances, be it cosine similarity or uh, Euclidean distance, or you can try different distance metrics too, uh, and look at how close they are. And so here's one such example. You know, you take the word of Sweden and you look in terms of cosine similarity and you basically find lots of words that 
are very, very close by or have uh, the largest cosine uh, similarity. And you basically get you know, Norway and Denmark to be very close, close by. And so if you have a lot of these kinds of data sets, and you know, this one, Wurzum 353, has basically 353 such pairs of words. And you can uh, look at how well do your vectors correlate, your vector distances correlate with these human judgments. So the higher the correlation, the more intuitive we would think are the distances in this large vector space. And again, Glove does very well here across a whole host of different kinds of uh, data sets like this Wurzum 353. And again, the largest uh, training data set here did best uh, for Glove. Any questions on word vector similarities? And correlations? No? Good. All right. Now, uh, basically... Intrinsic uh, evaluations have this huge problem, right? We have this nice similarities, but who knows? Maybe that doesn't actually improve the real tasks that we care about in the end. And so the best kinds of evaluations, but again, they're very expensive, are those on real tasks or at least subsequent kinds of downstream tasks. And so one such example is named entity recognition. It's a good one because it's relatively simple, but it's you know, actually useful enough. You might want to run a named entity recognition system over a bunch of your corporate emails to understand which person is in relationship to what company and where do they live and the locations of different people and so on. So it's actually kind of a useful system uh, to have, a named entity recognition system. And uh, basically, we'll go through the actual models for doing named entity recognition uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but as we plug in different word vectors into these downstream models that we'll describe uh, in the next lecture, we observe that uh, for many of them, glove vectors, again, do very, very well on these downstream tasks. All right, any questions on extrinsic metrics? We'll go through the actual model um, that, that works here later. That's right. So you basically look at, uh, well, you're, so you're not optimizing anything here. You're just evaluating, right? You're not training anything. You just, you train your word vectors with your objective function from Skipgram. Then you fix them, and then you just evaluate them. Uh, and so what you're evaluating here now is you look at, for instance, Sweden and Norway, and they have a certain distance between them. And then you want to basically look at the human uh, sort of, measure of how similar do humans think these two words are. And then you want these kinds of human judgments of similarity to correlate well with the cosine distances of the vectors. And when they correlate well, you think, oh, the vectors are capturing similar kinds of intuitions that people have, and hence they should be good. And, you know, again, intuitively, uh, it would make sense that if Sweden has good cosine similarity and you plug that into some other downstream system, that that system will also get better at capturing named entities, right? Because maybe at training time, it sees the vector of Sweden, and then at test time, it sees the vector of Norway, and at training time, you told that Sweden is a location, and so at test time, it might be more likely to correctly identify uh, Norway or Denmark also as a location, because they're actually close by in the vector space. And we'll go actually through an example of how we train word vectors and so on in the next lecture, too. Or train downstream tasks. All right, so I think we have till 5.50, so we got eight more minutes. Um, so let's look briefly at uh, simple single word classification. So, you know, we talked about these word vectors, and I basically uh, showed you the difference between starting with these very simple co-occurrence counts and these very sparse, large uh, vectors versus having small, dense vectors like with word to vec and so the major benefits are, are basically that because similar words cluster together, we'll be able to uh, classify and be more robust uh, in, in classifying um, different kinds of words that we might not see in the training data set. So for instance, because countries cluster together and we, if our goal is to classify location words, then we'll do better if we initialize all these country words to be in a similar part of the vector space. 
It turns out later we'll actually fine tune these vectors too. So right now we have learned an unsupervised objective function. It's unsupervised in the sense that we don't have human labels that we assigned to each input. We just basically took a large corpus of words and we learn uh, with these unsupervised objective functions. Um, but there are other tasks where that doesn't actually work as well. So for instance, sentiment analysis uh, turns out to not be a great downstream task for some, ta for some word vectors because good and bad might actually appear in similar contexts, right? I thought this movie was really good or bad. And so when your downstream task is sentiment analysis, it turns out that maybe you can just initialize your word vectors randomly. So this is kind of a bummer after listening to us for many hours uh, on how word vectors should be trained. But fret not, like it's in many cases, word vectors are helpful as your first step for your deep learning model. Just not always. And again, that will be something that you can evaluate. Can I just initialize my words randomly, or should I initialize them with the word to vec or the glove model? So as we're trying to classify words, uh, what we'll use is the softmax. And so you've seen uh, this equation already in the very beginning in the first slide of the lecture, but we'll change the notation a little bit because all the math uh, that will follow will uh, be easier to, to go through with this kind of notation. So this is going to be the softmax uh, that uh, we'll, we'll optimize. It's essentially just a different word uh, term for logistic regression. Uh, and we'll, in many cases, have generally a matrix W here for our different classes. So X, for instance, could be, in the simplest form, just a word vector. We're just trying to classify different word vectors with no context of just like, are these locations or not? It's not very useful, but, you know, just for pedagogical reasons, let's assume X, our input here, is just a word vector. And want to classify, is it a location or is it not a location? Right? And we give it, basically these different kinds of word vectors that we computed, uh, for instance, for Sweden and Norway, and then we want to classify is now Finland, Switzerland, and Bratwurst also a location, yes or no, right? So that's the task. And so our softmax here uh, might just have, uh, in the simplest case, um, two. Two doesn't really make sense, so let's say we have uh, multiple different classes, and each class has one row vector here. And so this notation y is essentially the number of rows that we have, so or the, the specific row that we have, and we have here an inner product with this row vector times this column vector x. And then we normalize just like we always do for logistic regression to get an overall uh, vector here for all the different classes that sums to 1. So w, in general, for classification will be a c by d dimensional matrix. Right, where D is our input, and C is the number of classes that we have. And again, logistic regression, just a different term for softmax uh, classification. And the nice thing about uh, you know, the softmax is that it will generalize well above uh, for multiple different classes. And so basically, uh, this is also something we've already uh, covered, so the loss function will use a similar term for all the subsequent lectures. Uh, loss function, cost function, objective functions, uh, we kind of use interchangeably. Um, and what we'll use to optimize the softmax is the cross entropy loss. And so, mm, I feel like the last minute, I'll just give you one extra minute, because if we start now, it'll be, it'll be too late. So, that's it. Thank you.